Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. God has graciously set his table before us in the Lord's Supper, which signifies many important aspects of our salvation, all of which comes through the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our focus last time we came together for the Lord's table was that when we come to this table, we are having table fellowship with God. I hope you keep that in mind every time you come to this table. That here we come, as Jesus said, partaking of his body and his blood. Of course, symbolically in these elements this morning. But when we trust in Christ and when we are trusting on him as we receive this supper, we do partake of Christ by communion with him in faith and in the presence of the Holy Spirit who is not just with us but in us. Today I want to bring us to another aspect of the Lord's table and that is the memorial aspect of this supper. As I've mentioned to you and when I was raised in the church That's all that was really stressed, was the memorial aspect. But it is one of the central aspects of this ordinance, when we come to it, that we are remembering the death of somebody. When we remember somebody's death, oftentimes we remember famous people or important people's death. We remember them oftentimes when we put a statue in the public square. Or we remember a day that is appointed for them in our any given society. And as those societies rise and fall, or nations rise and fall on this earth, those people, those great men and women will be remembered or they'll be forgotten. Already in our society, we're seeing statues come down, aren't we? Whether you're for it or against it, we are seeing that happen in our society. And that's the way of every nation that's ever been on the face of the earth, their great people, even within their own country, are forgotten. This service, this memorial, is so that the greatest person to ever live, the Lord of glory, will never be forgotten by his church, by his people. Though the world forgets who he is, and the world has tried to make us forget who he is, believe it, we will remember the Lord. And this is the way that he's ordained that we do it in this supper. Jesus, our Lord, instituted this ordinance himself. When we read the apostles' words there in 1 Corinthians 11.24, he is quoting Jesus. This do in remembrance of me. The Syriac translation, one of the earliest translations we have of the Bible, says it this way. Do this perpetually in remembrance of me. This is a memorial that is to continue, as the apostle says, until the return of Christ. And so for 2,000 years, the church has been partaking of these elements and remembering the Lord's death until he comes. And now we are remembering it again. We stand in a tradition, but not merely a tradition made by man, but one by God. And we will continue this tradition until our Lord returns. But what are we remembering when we come to this table? And the big picture, of course, is that we remember the Lord's death. That's what the apostle says there in verse 26. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
And we recall that God, the Son, indeed became man. He dwelt among us in perfect righteousness, but died as a substitute for sinners. His blood was poured out. His body was broken on the cross as an atonement for sin. And so when we ever, whenever we come to the Lord's table, we see that big picture, and we ought to always see that big picture. But we ought to always ask ourselves, when we come to this table, so that it doesn't just become a manner of rehearsal that we get used to. That's one of the dangers of things that we do often, and, and, and we come to things that we're familiar with, with a sense of familiarity that can be damaging to what we do. Some churches, they won't observe the Lord's table on any regular basis because they're afraid that the familiarity will breed contempt. You've heard of that saying, haven't you? Right? I have a, a friend who... He'll just pop it on, onto his people, you know. He leads a church, and every once in a while, they'll just have it without them really knowing that it's coming. My convictions lie that it's good to have it a little bit more often than that, so we do it once a month. But it should never breed contempt. One of the ways that we can help ourselves, and Scripture gives us this principle, is to ask, why are we coming to this table? Why? Exodus 12, 26, concerning the Passover and that memorial that was to continue as a shadow, really, until Christ fulfilled it, this comes up, this question. When your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You were to have an answer for them. So what do we mean by this memorial? Well, we can look at the big picture, and we can look at that big picture, and we can look at parts of that picture, to remember why we are coming here. And I want to take one aspect of the table this morning. You probably guessed it by the title of the sermon. And I want us to remember that the problem of sin is why we come to this table. This memorial should remind us when we come to it of the problem of sin. Romans 6.17 says this, you who were once slaves of sin. This slavery consisted not merely in what we did, but who we were, who we are. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says this, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Paul is saying he himself is a Jew, raised in a very religious world, is the same as this Gentile church of Ephesians. We all once lived this way. Among whom we all once live in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And listen to what he says. And we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. The consequence of the problem of our sin was not in the first place, then, that human flourishing is corrupted by it. Now that's often what we mean by the problem of sin in the modern church. The problem of sin is that we are faced with suffering in this world and immorality and injustice and all of those things we strive to fix in this world as a church that is conscientious of the problems of sin in the world. And so we try to create a culture. We try to redeem a culture. We try to redeem injustices and we try to correct sins in this world and that is not the first place that we see the problem of sin imparting its dilemma for mankind after Adam's sin plunging all of humanity into the problem of sin human flourishing was stifled for sure with the vanity of toil under the sun for every man and while the mandate to fill the earth that God gave is still in effect to this day, that becomes painful in childbearing for women. And it even creates this sort of matter of contention between husband and wife, which God also ordained at the very beginning. So God's 
purpose in creation is in a sense being stifled because of sin and the curse of sin that has come upon us. In addition to these things, sickness and hunger and famine and war, we're seeing that awful war that is taking place right now in the world, affecting all of the world. Not to mention the earth's groaning, the natural catastrophes. I don't know if that's what we call COVID or not. Probably not. But those things have happened, haven't they? Where natural catastrophes take the whole world by storm. Famine, pestilence, which is illnesses, bugs, viruses, those types of things are known to offset the entire world. In all of these ways, sin has come and it's wreaked havoc and its consequences have wreaked havoc upon mankind. But our greatest problem is still not yet mentioned when we mention those things. If you remember the warning that God gave Adam in chapter 2 of Genesis, do you believe in Genesis, the Genesis account? If you don't, you'll never take this seriously. You'll never take the Bible, you'll never take the atonement of Christ seriously, you'll never take the forgiveness of sin seriously. Chapter 2, 16 and 17 of Genesis says this, And Yahweh, God, Elohim, commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. That is the fundamental problem of sin and mankind, right there. That's the fundamental consequence of our sin. That is our greatest problem. And what does it mean? There's no end to this debate, it seems, about what that means. In the day you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. One thing is clear from the text of chapter 3. When Adam and Eve partake, they don't die. Right away, at least physically, they don't immediately die. And the day you shall eat, you shall surely die. They do, not, they do not immediately suffer physical death on that day. Paul says in Romans 5, and I think this is helpful, Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all have sin. And some say then, as a result of that text and what we read there in Genesis, that the process of death began once Adam and Eve partook of that fruit. Especially Adam there, we see theologically speaking, the responsibility was on him. So the process of death, some say, was what began there in Genesis chapter 3 when the sin, the first sin happened. And certainly that's true. The process of death began for Adam and and Eve, and for mankind then. But I don't think it gets to the bottom of what God means in Genesis chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 is helpful here, and here's what that says. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. And the reason why I say this is helpful, because after Adam and Eve sin, we see this very thing take place in the garden. Chapter 3, verse 8. After they sin, and they heard the sound of God, of the Lord, God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. Now implied in that is that this was something that happened regularly with Adam and Eve and God. They were communing together. But now they hear that God is in the, the midst of the garden walking, and what do they do? And the man and his wife hid themselves. They hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh among the trees of the garden. This gets at this great problem that we have because of our sin. There is no greater problem than that our sin separates us, mankind, made in God's image, from our Creator. There is no bigger problem than that. Not famine, 
not war, not debilitating diseases, chronic suffering. None of that compares with the loss of communion with God and the separation. But if we just merely by that separation also mean that God is over there and we're over here fending for ourselves and that's all, then we're also not listening to Scripture yet. Because I think he means even more than just God is over there and we're over here because of this. Because of God is who God is. He is the God of justice. We clamor for justice. And and let me tell you something. No matter what side of the debate or aisle you're on, politically speaking, everyone wants justice. Everybody wants justice. Why do you think statues are coming down? Because they think that's the way forward for justice. Whether they're right or wrong, the desire is justice. A few years ago, and I mentioned this before, I have a a magazine still in my office about the year of the protester. The protester. Time's person of the year was the protester during the Arab Spring and all of those protests that happened. Why is that? Because they view that justice has to be met for mankind to have any form of human flourishing, justice has to be met. Now we argue about what justice this and what justice that, but let me tell you something. The scriptures are clear that God is a God of justice and he will not turn the other way when sin happens in his creation. God will judge sin righteously. We don't judge sin righteously. We are terrible when it comes to justice. And I've said that before. God will judge righteously. And so when we get to the issue of separation of God from man, it's not that God is just over there saying, okay, they've gone their way and I've gone my way. Let them have all their consequences. No, God is a God who meets out justice. He's the creator. He's created us for his glory. We've all fallen short of it because we sin. In Adam and we sin in ourselves. And so we read in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. But we see that very peculiarly, death is set off not by annihilation of the human race, but the gift of God, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And because of the way that the Hebrew parallelism works, we should understand that death there doesn't mean the end. Because eternal life is not the end. What does death mean? Well, Jesus preached very often about this death. One of the ways that we see this death described often, in fact, in the last book of Scripture, is it's called the second death. Revelation 21, 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, these are those who are defined by their sin, which no Christian is. We're defined by the righteousness of Christ. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The lake, which in another place in Revelation says that suffering has no end. And Christ spoke about it in that exact way, where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. This is the great problem of mankind. We are separated from God because of our sin, from all of the beneficence of who he is, the very purpose for our creation. And on the other hand, the wrath of God abides on us in that condition of sin. There is nothing worse than that for human beings. It used to be that the church was motivated by love for the the world because they understood that that condition meant absolute misery for mankind. 
And now the church's main priority in general is that we just fix all of the temporal problems. If that was God's greatest concern, Jesus never would have died on the cross at Calvary. You understand who Jesus was? He came healing sick people, sufferers, giving blind people their sight, removing demonic oppression from human beings. He came removing temporal suffering. But he didn't remain there, did he? Yes, the church has responsibility in society to see that righteousness prevails. We absolutely have a responsibility. But our first calling is to say there's a reason why God the Son became man and the purpose for his becoming man was to go to Calvary. It's because our central problem was this division between mankind and God which will lead to eternal judgment. And unless that is resolved, and that's only resolved through Jesus Christ and him crucified, there is no solution for mankind. Because if we solve our temporal suffering, we still have to face God in the day of judgment for our sin problem. I, I know a little bit about suffering in the last couple of years. A very little bit compared to many others. And I'll tell you this, the re relief from my temporal suffering was very much a concern for me. When you suffer, it's no fun. But as believers, that should lead us. And as sinners, that should lead you to the answer of what eternal suffering would be. As believers, it should lead us to worship God, to, to love God more, to see that sinners come to faith in that God who forgives sins. But it needs to be held in front of us. Brother Jason told me a couple weeks he heard a pastor say, hopefully you're okay with me saying this, that the church is so consumed with preaching about the temporal hells that we experience. That's first place not the eternal hell that sinners face. That's not our first concern. And that's exactly opposite of the way that scriptures concern itself with the problem. So why do we come to the Lord's table? Because there's a problem, and that problem is sin. Every time we come to this table, we need to understand that the reason we come to this table, the reason why the blood and the body of Christ is represented here is because of the problem of sin. Why did Christ die? But for the problem of sin. It was the will, yes, of the Father. It was the will of the Son, but it was the answer for the problem of sin. Secondly, Jesus Christ and him crucified is indeed the only answer for the problem of sin. When we come to the table of the Lord, we are reminded of the means, the only means of our deliverance from sin and the judgment we deserve as sinners before God. And that is the atonement that Jesus made for us with his own blood. Mark 10, 45. He came to, for his life to be laid down as a ransom for many. Ransom is a payment for sin in that context. The author of the Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews when drawing right theology out of the Old Testament, the shadows of the sacrificial laws of the Old Covenant, says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. It's because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Death is the requirement of the justice of God because of sin. The shedding of blood signifies that that price is paid. And one essential aspect of our redemption from sin is first that the penalty of sin must be met. Remember I said God is just. Well, how is that met? When we come to the table, we are reminded how God has met our problem of sin. The problem of our guilt before God. Our condition. Second, forgiveness depends on a substitute. And we see both of these things in two examples of the Old Testament. Remember the promise God gave to Abraham? I, I've been reading a lot about Abraham lately. 
I'm amazed by Abraham's faith. I don't know if you are. He's a pagan in this, this Ur of the Chaldees. God calls him to himself, seemingly the only one in the world. You ever think about that? After Noah, there's just this many years go by. We don't really know how many years. It's, there's some close guesses, I think. But many years go by after Noah, and all of a sudden, God calls Abram. Where, where are the other ones? Where are the other believers? He calls them out of, Ur of Chaldees, which we know was a pagan world. Graciously, he calls him, him out. I'm going to go and I'm going to give you the, the nations for your inheritance. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Gives him all these promises. Well, one of those promises for him to have a nation, he first has to have a child. Right? We know that the trial of Abraham. Time goes by. He's called when he's 75 years old. Any 75-year-old folks in here want to have children? Well, it was a little different then because he died when he was 100 and something. I forget, 20-something. And, and uh, so he, he was working on a longer schedule than we are, probably. But, but 10 years go by, no child, 85. Uh, his wife looks at him, why don't you take my maid? You know, that's what God meant. And so he, he takes a maid and he has a child and Ishmael is born and no, Sarah's going to have it. And Sarah hears it and, and Abram hears it when he's 99 and they both chuckle. Okay, 25, 24 years now and, and uh, sure the promises are going to happen. I think they believed. I think sometimes our faith is not as strong and so we chuckle. <laughs> but I do believe they believed. They had some element of faith. And so uh, a year later, of, of course you know, she has a child and Isaac is his name. Genesis 21. And then Genesis 22, the next chapter. And all we know of Jacob, or I'm sorry, of Isaac, is that he's weaned. Isaac is his son of promise. He's weaned, and he's able to carry a load of wood on his back up a mountain. That's all we know. Because chapter 22, God tells Abraham, take your son. You're the only son, the son who you love. And go up on this mountain and offer him up as a burnt offering. Now, the, the idea of a burnt offering, if you read in Leviticus 1, was an atonement offering. And first, the person was killed and the blood was sprinkled first. So don't let that throw you off. This is an atonement for sin. Take him up there and offer him up to me. And... I don't know what goes through Abraham's mind. A lot has been written. The, the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard wrote a massive work on what did Abraham go through. We don't know altogether, but I don't think it was easy. I think in when, when it says in, in Romans and in Hebrews chapter 11 about Abraham's faith, that he believed that God could raise him again from the dead. We don't see that in the text, but that was there evidently. That's why he went, and he went up there. He trusted God. And he went up there to slaughter his son, to sacrifice his son. And no sooner is his hand in the air coming down that God yells out. Actually, he, interestingly enough, the angel of the Lord calls out, Abraham, Abraham. Now, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, I believe, is often a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. So you have this. If that's the case, if that's what's happening, you have Christ, God the Son, calling out Abraham. Abraham, don't kill your son. No, I, I was trying your faith. I was testing your faith. I know you love, I know you believe me. Your son won't solve your problem. But what happens up there? Abraham no sooner hears that word as he turns around and there's a ram caught in the thicket. Here's a substitute for your son. But when you hear those words, Abraham, take your son, your only son, the son who you love. And you hear that the angel of the Lord, perhaps Christ in his pre-incarnate way, uh, appearance, calls Abraham, stop. We are left with this picture that God has a plan for, for sin that will actually solve it. But the clues are there in the words that it's going to be 
God who provides a lamb. And it's going to be the Son of God, the only Son, the Son whom he loves, that will be the substitute. Because mankind and our sin could never substitute for each other's death. God never, it's abhorrent to God, human sacrifice. It's the only ancient religion, by the way, where that is true. Before Christ, every ancient religion had some form of human sacrifice to appease the gods. Always it's abhorrent to God. Why? Because the problem of sin is in man. But it wasn't in the man whom God appointed. Christ was without sin, perfect, sinless, without spot, without blemish, the Lamb of God. The other example that we see in the Old Testament is the example of the Passover. I won't dwell on this long, but Egypt is, Israel is in bondage to Egypt. They're in bondage to slavery, which of course is a shadow, it's a representation of mankind's bondage to sin. That's what God was doing. He was often foreshadowing all of our problems in his promised people, his people of promise in Israel. And Yahweh was hardening Pharaoh's heart through nine plagues. He would not let Israel go, but God also promised on this tenth plague, Israel or Egypt or Pharaoh is not only going to let you go, he's going to drive you out. And what was required in that tenth plague? The firstborn of every household in Egypt, of Pharaoh's house and the livestock, everything, to show that God was the true God and the gods of Egypt were no gods at all. But what was the means of Israel's safety? It was a lamb, whether from the goats or from the sheep, a month old, pure, spotless, without blemish, and they killed a lamb and they and they use the blood of that lamb on the doorposts and on the lintels. And when the angel of the Lord passes over, he'll see the blood and he'll pass over. Not judging that house. Why? Because there was a substitute for those people in that house. But everyone who didn't have the blood applied on the doorposts of that house, that judgment came upon the firstborn of the land of Egypt. These two examples of the substitute and atonement for sin and the lamb that was a substitute for sin are for our encouragement. Not merely to believe them, but to believe on what they signified, what is the fulfillment of those shadows, those foretellings, that God provided a perfect and spotless lamb when he provided his only son as a problem for sin as the answer for the problem of sin. And this is the son whom he loved for eternity. In order to take away the sins of the world, he was rendered up. Jesus did willingly when he gave himself a ransom for many. When according to Hebrews 7.27, he offered up himself. We come to this table, we see the problem of sin before us. We're reminded of it, but we're reminded of the answer of it. That God has provided a lamb. Through the blood of the Lamb, through the body of the Lamb, through his life that was spent for us, the condemnation for our sin, the punishment for our sin, death, separation from God, hell, fire, was answered in the Lamb of God. When you hear these words this morning, this is my body which is for you and this is the cup of the new covenant and my blood, may we hear again the answer for the problem of our sin and the forgiveness of it. No longer are we separated from God. As I said last time, we are called to table fellowship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not merely that we are forgiven our sins. We are told to draw near to God, brought back into fellowship, brought back into a state of worship and enjoy of the, the God who created us, who made us in his image, and we are being conformed to the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. To this table, by his command and invitation, we are brought near to God through the everlasting and finished work of Christ. 
Here is ransom, atonement, redemption signified for us here. Ransom, the payment for a slave to take them from the slave market. Atonement, which can be rendered in the, in the, in the way that the English word is spoken, at one minute. We are brought to one, to communion with God through the sacrifice of Christ. The redemption has been paid. How was it paid? And for whom was it paid? Romans 3.23 25, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's Jew and Gentile in the context. Doesn't matter what your family lineage was. The call is for you to hear this good news that God gave his son for sinners. What did he give him for? How did that come to you, this sinner that you are? You've all fall short of the glory of God, but are justified by his grace as a gift. It's not of your own doing, in other words, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He paid the price for you. He died in your place. And it's sufficient. Once and for all, he's the sacrifice, Hebrews says, for us, for sin. No more to die again, and he's not requiring our death as a payment at all. He's not even requiring our good works. Our good works can add nothing to Jesus Christ and his atonement. God put him forward, it says, as a propitiation, a very important word, which means that Jesus and his sacrifice satisfied God's wrath. He's the means of the mercy of God, of a just God. How does God who is just say to you, the sinner, you are justified? He says it here, to receive, to be received by faith. You receive Jesus by faith in his finished work, and God is just to forgive you of your sins, to say of you, you are righteous, not in yourself, but in Jesus Christ. He counts Christ's righteousness your own, just as he counted your sin as Christ on Calvary. The old theologians used to call that the great transaction. (laughs) Our sin upon him, his righteousness, ours, by faith. We should be reminded of that when we come to this table. Finally, and very quickly, examination of sin. If you are not a believer this morning, what do you do with your sin? If you're not trusting in Christ, what are you trusting in? What what civil situation will be your redemption before God? What social problem, if that's corrected, will correct your guilt before God? You know, we read the Old Testament, and we are surprised, aren't we? You preached a while ago about Uzzah, didn't you? And I just read to our kids in Joshua the story of Achan, who took some silver. He took a little gold from Nineveh after God commanded, don't take any of those things. A little brass, just a little bit, and I buried it with the rest of our stuff. And we say, God is so wrathful to meet on not just Achan, but his whole house judgment for that sin. Condemnation. And we say, how could God do such a thing? Well, let me tell you something. That question is increased insurmountably when we ask, how could God pour out his wrath on his only son who never sinned? And the problem is not with God's sense of judgment, but with ours. We think of sin so lightly. Absolutely, we think so lightly of it that God would ever hold us accountable for sin. But what did I say about our own sense of justice? We demand it, don't we? In our temporal form, we demand it. But may I say, God is the one who will rectify all wrongs. And he is the one who pronounces true justice in this world. And that he pronounces justice on his own son when he sends him to the cross. And when the son cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is a word to you today of mercy. 
so that God is the justifier, just and the justifier of those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. God is just to forgive you of your sins because your judgment was taken upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And his mercy is just in that, in that sense. And so I say to you, as the scriptures say to you, today is the day of salvation in Hebrews. You come to this table, don't come thinking if you partake of these elements, you're going to be saved. It's what these elements, it's who they represent who will save you, who is your salvation. And to believers, this table is also a memorial to remind us to never again turn back to the comforts of sin. If you think that sin is just okay, you know, hey, you're, you're, you're justified, you're saved, so God is okay with my sin. In the first place, you need to judge yourself lest you be judged. Anybody who has that flippant view of sin is in danger of having a false profession of faith. Not of losing your salvation. But you need to be confronted with the scriptures. But those of us who are believers in Christ, when we come to this table, this is what our sin cost the Son. This is what your sin cost him. More suffering than we could ever imagine. The wrath of God, hell was born out upon Christ for your sin if you're a believer. Do you come to the table lightly? No, we come, as the Apostle Paul says, examining ourselves. How is your heart before God? What is your lifestyle before God? Are you living in sin? Is that the trajectory of your life? Now, every Christian sins. And we are brought back continually to 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this table reminds us that that's true, that your sins are cleansed through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for you. So this should have a sanctifying effect on us when we come to this table, a purifying effect on us. If you love Christ represented in this table, you should abhor your sin that sent him to the cross. We should always confess our sins, especially when we come here. We are reminded of what they cost Christ, our Lord, the Son of God. By faith that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, we should always remember. So we partake of this by faith. Not because we're righteous enough, but because Christ is able to cleanse us. He is the one who cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I hope you come to the table of the Lord remembering that it reminds us of the problem of sin and how great a problem it was, of the love of God to meet that problem in his own son, and that by examination you come and are sanctified when you receive it, not in the things themselves, but in what they draw us to, to remember the cost that Christ paid for your sin, and the direction and the, con- the trajectory he calls you to, which is a life of holiness by his power. Let's pray. Our Father.